speaking next in a talk entitled Where We Are At is Vice President and Portfolio Manager with the private investment firm of Gregory J. Schwartz and Company Incorporated. They're located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. He manages corporate retirement plans, is a personal financial planner, and also a very good friend. Captain Bruhan served in the United States, Germany, and Middle East for seven years as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army. He attended the Canadian Land Forces Command and Staff College. Following completion of airborne and ranger training, he served with the 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry, along the Iron Curtain. Mr. Bruhan served as the commander of Bravo Troop, 1st Squadron, 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment during Operation uh, Desert Storm. And I commend you for your service. For 13 years, he taught as an adjunct assistant professor at Walsh College. He is a guest lecturer at our university, at the University of Detroit Mercy. He has published in Barron's, the Detroit News, Crane's Detroit Business, the Marine Corps Gazette, and Infantry Magazine. He has appeared on Neil Cavuto and National Public Radio. Mr. Bruhan has briefed the Vice President, members of Congress, and the United States International Trade Commission. His new book, Spread the Wealth, More Haves, Fewer Have Nots, has been published by Hamilton Books. And Mr. Bruhan has copies of that book available for all of you to peruse and, and, and possibly even buy. He received a Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Science in Finance at Walsh College. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. David R. Bruhan. And I wanted to start with a cute story about a federal contract in Washington uh, that was set for bid. And three contractors were uh, involved, one federal, one from the state of Michigan, and one from the state of Nebraska. And it was to fix a fence by one of the services buildings. And all three contractors showed up to the superintendent of grounds. And the first contractor got out his uh, uh, calculator and measuring devices and totaled the bid at $900. And the superintendent said, well, how'd you come up with that? And the contractor was from Michigan. He said, well, uh, there's, there's 400 for labor, 400 for materials, and $100 profit. The superintendent said, okay. The fellow from Nebraska, the other state contractor, came in and said, uh, well, give me a second. He did the same thing that the Michigan contractor did, and he said it'll be $700. $300 for labor, $300 for materials, $100 profit. I said, okay. So the third contract, the federal contractor, came in, and he said it'll be $2,700. And the superintendent said, what? You didn't measure anything. He goes, it's easy. 1000 for me, 1000 for you. We're hiring a guy from Nebraska to fix the fence. And that's how it works in Washington. So um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I wanted to go over kind of where we are with respect to both the world and the United States and start with uh, the absolute black swan in foreign affairs, which as you all have come to know in the last two months is Russia. Now having spoken to a few folks that are classmates that are both in service and retired, um, Many individuals believe that this was an opportunistic move by Mr. Putin rather than something that was pulled off the shelf. For those of you who have studied military history, the United States in the 1930s came up with a series of rainbow plans uh, in case Japan attacked or Germany attacked the United States. We'd have these plans literally on the shelf to be pulled off. So many people in Department of Defense don't view what Putin did as one of these rainbow plan deals, he just acted with instinct. And many histori uh, historians uh, view that really since Catherine the Great, that the, the Russian Empire has always wanted a warm water port. So with the um, chaos in Ukraine, uh, it was simply a move by Mr. Putin uh, to make sure that Russia did not lose access uh, to any warm water port uh, and, and did so with and without force. Um, 
Now he has roughly 40,000 troops, which is about two land divisions massed on the Ukrainian border uh, in the east. Um, historians will also tell you that armies are meant to be used. So whether he decides to use them or not, he has induced fear uh, in the government of Ukraine and has also spurred interest by pro-Russian Ukrainians in the eastern part of that country uh, to seize buildings and to welcome Russian forces in uh, as a protectorate. Now it's interesting that the President of uh, the United States mentioned that he is, he's more worried about uh, a nuclear weapon in Manhattan uh, than he has been about the, the Russians. And you, you have to be careful when you speak and you give green lights uh, with respect to what U.S. policy is. The very nature of deterrence is to indu induce doubt in your adversaries into not doing something, believing that whether or not you will do something, you'll actually do it. And there are two instances in U.S. history uh, since the 1950s where by saying something uh, at the national level, we gave green lights to two adversaries. The first was in Korea. In the early summer of, of 1950, the United States Secretary of State was asked what United States interests are in the Far East. Uh, and the individual stated that U.S. interests included Australia, the Philippines, and Japan, and left out one important area, which was? Korea South Korea. And one month later, North Korea attacked South Korea. Uh, in the middle part of 1990, a uh, U.S. ambassador to Iraq was asked whether or not the United States had a mutual defense treaty with Kuwait. And she said no. And three weeks later, Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait. So when it comes to deterrence, you always want to have your adversary uh, give pause. I think that was one of Ronald Reagan's great strengths, is, is, is he pursued in his administration a dual track in foreign policy with Margaret Thatcher and collectively using the forces of the Vatican because the Pope was Polish and the administration decided to induce doubt as to whether if the Soviets invaded Western Europe there would be an insurrection in Poland and the Soviet forces would not be allowed to be reinforced because their line of communication through Poland would be cut from Russia. Whether or not that would have happened, like Star Wars, we do not know. But Reagan made Gorbachev blink. In many cases with your adversary, that's what you have to do. In the United States, I've likened our economy and our system to getting a B plus in a C minus world. So when people ask, how are we doing? It's all relative. Life is a curve, as you know. So we can tr continue to attract foreign capital. Our economy is good. It's not great, but it's better than the rest of the world. When you look at areas like uh, Europe that's still recovering, um, you look at Russia, uh, you look at other areas to invest your assets, the United States still offers the best return on their money uh, and the most secure. By way of example, individuals when it comes to investing like, like security and safety. And one of the best examples of that is most of you are uh, at least versed in some history, more recent than not. Does anybody know what day John F. Kennedy was assassinated? <clears throat> November 22nd, 1963. Does anybody know what day of the week that was? Very close, it was actually a Friday. Do any of you know what happened on Sunday at one o'clock Eastern time? And it has nothing to do with the assassination. We played football. There was a moment of silence at every stadium in the United States for one minute, and then we kicked off. Okay, so in theory, the most powerful man in the world at the time was assassinated. The vice president took the oath of office on Love Field on the tarmac in Air Force One, Lyndon Johnson. The nuclear torch passed from one individual to the other and the world did not change except for the assassination of the president. 
So most people still bank on the fact that we are going to be here because of your political, economic, and social systems that the United States remains resilient. You've got an oil boom. Like it or not, you've got a lot of oil. And in theory, we could be self-sufficient by the year 2020. Warren Buffett's Burlington Northern Santa Fe from the western states and the Union Pacific are hauling oil to the tune of millions of gallons a year from Bakken to the refineries in Houston. There's fracking going on from Pennsylvania all the way to California. Uh, and with respect to the lack of the Keystone Pipeline, I spoke to an executive at TransCanada and he said, we're going to mine this stuff anyway. So whether you sell it to you guys, if you don't build a pipeline, we'll build a railroad or we'll sell it to China, that oil is going to be mined. And it's very, very healthy with respect to pricing. Because everything in the world, whether it's by ship, plane, or train, needs to be transported. So one of the niceties of this oil boom is it's made it possible to actually counteract the pricing in inflation that the Federal Reserve has generated. When you look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve pre-crisis in 2008, it was about $600 billion. Now it's about $4.1 trillion. That's an awful lot of paper to be held on the books that nobody else wanted but the federal government. In fact, they just recently closed the limited liability corporations. If you go back and look at the Fed's balance sheet, there were three main limited liability corporations that were created to take all the toxic assets out of the private sector and dump it onto the public sector. And these were called Maiden Lane, two words, Maiden Lane. And the history of that street is that is the actual street, Maiden Lane, in which the Federal Reserve Bank in New York sits on. So if you go back a couple of years and look at the Fed's balance sheet, you'll have these Maiden Lane LLCs, and it was all the toxic assets from Bear Stearns and Lehman that they actually dumped onto their own balance sheet. And now they've sold those off, interestingly enough, at a profit. Our GDP is going to plot along at 2 or 3% a year. From a personal standpoint, being an amateur economist, I'm more of a historian, uh, I don't know how health care is going to be cheaper. So the administration came, came out and said, you know, with these, with these plans and the gold, silver, lead, and bronze, or however you want to categorize them, uh, health care is somehow going to be cheaper. From a practical standpoint, if you have a fixed supply of providers, whether it's bicycles, Apple, corn, soybeans, or health care, and you increase the demand by 1 million, 2 million, 7 million, or 10 million, I don't know how the price of that good will go down. Interestingly enough, the way business becomes more efficient is to, is to be innovative and to counteract the decrease in prices that would result in me as a service provider buying a piece of technology that would make me more efficient. The law is that now medical devices are going to be taxed, which would make those goods more expensive. So between a tax on the capital goods that drives up the price of efficiency, and also the seven million people that have been now moved on to the roles of healthcare, from a practical standpoint, I don't know how healthcare will become more inexpensive. We all know as rational people, and let's be candid, that there is a problem with our healthcare system. Everybody knows that. We're just not sure that the solution that's been offered is the right solution. I think from a competitive standpoint, opening up the different states to each other's insurers to become more competitive across state lines would be a great place to start. In the capital markets in the United States, business has a lot of cash, trillions of dollars. They've got enough cash where Microsoft decided not to finance the purchase of Nokia by using capital from abroad and bringing it back into the US. In essence, they avoided a 35% corporate tax. So they used the foreign accounts to buy Nokia and never brought the cash back into the United States and saved 35% in taxes. 
<clears throat> the markets are up roughly 175% since the bottom in March of 2009. We're probably due for a correction. Every three years or so, the stock market corrects 10 to 20%. Business is hiring very selectively. They'll look at 1,000 resumes and hire three people because they can. Even in Michigan, you see lots of construction. In both the residential and non-residential area, we finally got construction in housing and uh, in the business community started again. And that's very positive. Folks, rates are going up. Right now, the 10-year treasury is about 2.62%. The low was around 1.5 or 1.6 uh, reached last year. So if you are still looking at buying a house or trying to refinance, now is a good time to do it because anything under a 6% mortgage historically is, historically is a good deal. I remember rates in the late 80s, 9.5% uh, for a 30-year fixed. And in general, you can probably pay about four, four and a half to five for a 30-year now, and that's probably a pretty good deal. Folks talk of a bubble. Well, right now, the stock market price to earnings ratio is about 16 to 17 times earnings. To me, if you look at the bubble, it's in the bond market. If you just take the price of a bond, which matures at $1,000, and they trade in hundreds. So if, if you divide 100 by the yield on the 10-year treasury, which is around 2.62, the price to earnings ratio on that is about 38 times. So to me, if you want to look at a bubble, it's in the bond market, not the stock market. I know one of our colleagues is going to talk on the minimum wage, uh, and I'll just uh, add this, that a minimum wage treats a symptom, not the cause. And the cause of the fact that your dollar buys less and less is inflation. And Milton Friedman said it best that inflation is above all a monetary event. And as Professor Weglar's mentioned about inflation keeping even with GDP, if you expand the money stock greater than GDP, you're gonna have inflation. Don't talk to me about core inflation. I'm a pocketbook guy. And when you double the cost of food and you increase the cost of fuel 150% in 10 years, you will destroy the poor and the middle class. And no federal program can fix that. So if you want to be candid and honest with the public, anytime you've gone to the printing press and recorded history, it doesn't create jobs, and it doesn't create wealth. Usually, the opposite occurs. But in general, we're in fairly good shape. Again, we're a B-plus country in a C-minus world. We'll probably be okay. But the question to you as citizens are, are you, is, are you satisfied with okay? People often talk about term limits in the republic. We don't need them. We have elections every two years. So if you get fired up and you don't like the policy, it's your duty as citizens in a republic to change it. And I will end on that note. Thank you very much. Uh, wanna... Given the fact that uh, Mr. Bruhan will not be able to stay with us for the entire symposium, um, I'm asking now, are there some questions that you may want to address to him? After questions, we will then take a very short break and we'll come back and we will uh, conclude our symposium. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Yes, sir, in the front. Could you elaborate on what you were talking about with the bond market? Yeah, the bond market. Um, the reason I don't believe that, and this is just me guessing like you guessing, uh, that the stock market is not necessarily in a bubble, even though it's up 170% from the bottom, is that from what I read and hear, the general public is not yet invested in the stock market. Why? 1998, 2002, and 2008, the general public and everybody else really got burned by the downturns. And a lot of people sold at the bottom. So the general public still is not yet in. But when you look at, you know, in general over 60 years in the stock market, the price to earnings ratio, that is where the general market is, supported by the earnings that have that price, is about 16 or 17 times. And right now, historically, we're about where we should be with the markets, even though we're at record highs at 16,000 on the Dow. But when you, when you look at what you're being paid, 2.62, for the price of a bond, it's almost double the stock market. 
because everybody's flooded into bonds as a safe haven. The most poignant lesson I learned in, in money management is that when you're, you use mutual funds, and I'm a mutual fund guy, I don't really do individual corporate bonds, or, I'm not a stockbroker, I'm more of a financial planner, is that most people don't understand that you can lose money in a bond fund. I mentioned that bonds trade for $1,000 like a certificate of deposit, they're not insured. But if you hold a bond to maturity and the company doesn't go bankrupt, you're gonna get $1,000 and you're gonna get interest payments every six months until that bond matures. What most people don't understand is that in mutual funds, you may have 300 bonds or 3,000 bonds that mature at different time frames. So if rates go up, the price of a bond goes down, they're inversely related. So that's where the hazard is. And intentionally, in both the retirement plans I manage and for most of my individual clients, I don't have any mutual fund whose duration is out more than about seven years. Because the further you're out in duration with your bonds, the more the bond will fluctuate if interest rates go up or down. So from a practical standpoint, I think the public is piled into bonds, a lot of people are in cash, uh, and if rates go up, you're gonna have a lot of people sell because they're not prepared to lose money in bonds, and that could um, make the bond selling more rapid. And I don't think folks are prepared for that, especially retirees, because everybody has been, been what? They've been chased out of certificates of deposit and money markets because what are they paying? Zero. So if you have parents or, or older folks that are in bond mutual funds, you know, it, it would be not nosy but prudent on your part to make sure that they're not holding securities that are out 25 or 30 years because they can really get whipsawed. And when rates go up, they can go up very fast. Uh, we saw that last year when the Federal Reserve said, hey, you know, we're eventually gonna stop buying $85 billion a month in our own debt. And just that enough was enough to move interest rates up one full percentage point in about four months. And that shocked, uh, that shocked a lot of folks. Anybody else? Yes, in the back, sir? If you were to set up a portfolio right now for someone five year time frame conservative, what would your allocation be? Uh, is it, uh, the question is developing a portfolio for five years that's conservative. Are most of it in retirement or IRA assets, or would most of that be uh, taxable? I, I, I don't believe that municipalities are gonna fail in the United States. Um, so depending on your tax situation, which is always my primary concern, uh, you, want, you might wanna look at limited term, tax-free municipal bonds. I would stay federal, I wouldn't go to be locked in any particular state, especially California or Michigan. Michigan's okay, but depending on how the bankruptcy rolls out from the city of Detroit, you could pay a, a, a premium in fear uh, of 10 to 20 basis points just on what goes on in the city. The uh, city will probably turn around given all the interest and, and the amount of uh, corporate interest that's there. Everybody from Dan Gilbert to Roger Penske, uh, it'll probably turn, it's gonna take some time. Uh, but, but I would do, if you're doing a bond portfolio, um, <clears throat> I would keep the maturities less than three years uh, and, and keep the quality high, definitely single A or above, and maybe put some corporates in there if you want any equities, I, I would keep uh, value with high dividend payers like Procter & Gamble and uh, McDonald's and the companies that, that can be counted on for pay a dividend. Be careful of what's called the dividend yield trap though. Just because like Verizon might pay you 5% doesn't mean the stock won't drop 20 uh, if something happens between North and South Korea. So beware of the dividend yield trap. Yes, follow up? Yeah, you know, most biotechnology funds and stocks were up 60%, so you're gonna have a healthy correction. If you look at some of the funds out there, look at the 2008 numbers. I think Franklin has a biotech fund that was down 10 or 12% when the market was down 40. So if your equities are five to 10 year holdings, whether you own a stock or you own a mutual fund. So these things, not to be glib about it, but these things do that. 
So as long as you have a longer term time horizon uh, and you trust the manager, you always invest with the person, whether it's a financial advisor or somebody like Bill Gross at PIMCO um, or George Evans at Oppenheimer, invest with the person. E equities can go up or down 40% in a year. You've all lived through it. Um, so if it's a slice of the portfolio and you think that biotech deserves to be part of the portfolio, it is possible historically to put $1,000 in a fund or a stock and have it go to 500 before it goes to 1500. So just because something goes down, it's bad. Uh, it, it's just there's a lot of air in that price, and right now the air's coming out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, the, the question is concerning foreign investment in real estate in Michigan, speci specifically Chinese investors. Um, first of all, in real estate, there's three rules. Location, location, location. So you got to know where you're buying. And in any business situation, you want to have an exit strategy, especially in real estate. The biggest concern with respect to a Chinese investor or any foreign investor uh, in the United States is not the real estate. It's the currency. So you don't want to make a great real estate investment and then have China devalue or uncouple the yuan to the dollar and you make you know 50 percent over 20 years in real estate and, and lose 70 percent on the currency exchange uh, that's your biggest risk. So you got to be really careful with respect to um, your currency. Depending on where you are in the state of Michigan you'll probably be okay. There's a lot of foreign money that's coming into your tier one markets like Miami and New York and Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Seattle, billions of dollars. Because a lot of folks out there think that we're going to be okay now. Um, but you got to watch those currency swaps. Things overseas can get squirrely. It's a highly technical term very fast. <laughs> we'll take one more question and then we'll take a quick break. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. E, the E portion, earnings are extremely high. Profit margins are the highest they have ever been, 10% versus historically 6. Yeah. Can the E, is it sustainable? Uh, we'll probably plateau because there, everything in finance you have to look at. Uh, ratios are only good if you compare them to something else. So there, there is an enormous amount of pent-up demand. I have a, a friend of mine who's a car dealer. He said, you know, you can't move cars when there's, when there's a foot of snow on them. So with respect to earnings, the United States is, is still probably coming up as a guess um, in housing and, and autos. Uh, there's probably a little bit of room to go. Uh, Europe, there's probably a long way to go. Europe actually had a bond rally last year, I believe. Um, and the euro is actually cl close to 140, correct me if I'm wrong. China's, er uh, China's earnings are slowing. I believe that their gross domestic product uh, is um, announced when something is built, like real estate, not in the United States, when something is sold. So that, that may a bit, be a bit inflated. But American companies are lean. They're very selfish right now. They're worried about health care. They're worried about Sarbanes-Oxley. They're worried about Dodd-Frank. And like I said, they look at a thousand resumes and hire three people. So they've got trillions of dollars in cash. And they're, they're not scared to death, but they're very cautious. Thank you very much for attending on a Saturday, and we'll take a 10-minute break. <laughs>